Hi, everyone. Thanks very much for coming. Um, I'm really delighted that we have Joseph Slaughter uh, here this evening, who is Associate Professor of English and Comparative Literature at Columbia University. Um, this event is one that is organized uh, between the Franklin Humanities Institute and one of our um, components, which is the Duke Human Rights Center at the Franklin Humanities Institute. And um, what we have tried to do since last year is to have an event that brings together our theme, uh, the general theme of the Franklin Humanities Institute with a human rights um, component. So last year, our theme was water and we had an event um, about water. Um, and this year, our theme is world arts, which is obviously a very broad theme. Um, why world arts? Um, uh, the theme of world arts is actually part of a sort of larger project um, uh, at the Franklin Humanities Institute of trying to think about the ways in which the humanities conceives of the world. Um, it's partly uh, with the idea that in this age of the global university, uh, sometimes what, what is meant by the global and how the world became the globe, as it were, is left out of the conversation. And so we want to bring it back and put it front and center um, in the way in which we imagine the, de the, the, the design, if you like, of, um, of the new global university for the humanities. What would it be if, if, if we were shaping if we were shaping it. Um, and uh, and so, so we have a number of ideas over the next few years that will be playing out. Um, one, the, the first um, is world arts. Um, another will be on the question of right, and we could maybe, uh, we'll have to have Joseph back at that point. The question of right, where we'll be looking at um, uh, the question of natural rights to human rights, civil rights, copyright, et cetera, et cetera. What kinds of ideas um, of, um, of the world are um, conceived within those categories? Ecologies will be another one and the question of technology, um, <clears throat> which of course has been around for forever, but has taken on a, um, a, a, a new kind of pertinence at the moment. So, so, jo Joseph Slaughter's work um, is very, very appropriate to thinking about this question of, um, of human rights with world arts. His award-winning book, Human Rights, Inc., is a contribution to the way in which we understand the relationship between literary subjects, literary concepts of the human, and and the literary arts. And there have been various attempts to do this in different sorts of ways. I'll just throw out a couple for you. Lynn Hunt thinks about, um, about this mostly in relation to the post-French revolution, um, 18th century ideas of, um, 18th and then 19th century ideas of, um, of, uh, um, of, of the Declaration of the Rights of Man, um, uh, from from the uh, from the so-called French Revolution um, to think about whether that is um, indeed um, uh, a moment that that is aptly called revolution or not is is a question that I think that um, that maybe we might we might hear a little bit about uh, today. Um, in another vein, we've had someone like Barbara Johnson thinking about the relationship between uh, the lyric. Um, the lyric poem and the law, the way in which subjects are conceived and they come into being through their production in language. Um, uh, the, there, there isn't any subject of the law prior to its creation within the law, just as there isn't really a subject, a, um, a, a speaking voice of lyric poetry prior to its constitution within the lyric, right? So, so many of these, many of these, um, Attempts to think human rights and um, uh, and the liter and literature together have this sort of strong focus on the way in which language um, uh, um, shapes the uh, formation of the human of the subject um, at any given moment. <clears throat> now, in um, in Professor Slaughter's book, we um, we have a, a, a focus on a particular kind of formation of the novel. 
a very important moment in the formation of the novel, that is the Bildungsroman, um, which is um, broadly the development of, um, of, of, uh, of the person over a lifetime involving, um, involving some kind of change. It's a very crude way of putting it, but broadly, bro broadly in that, it, it, it's that. Um, and um, and that uh, that term Bildungsroman, um, you may hear it, um, is one that uh, that uh, comes from the German. Um, and uh, Professor Slaughter, in his book, really works through these ideas of the different kinds of concepts that that emerge in different kinds of literary traditions by virtue of their constitution of the subject that is either exclusive exclusive of or coterminous with an idea of the human that is emerging as a rights-bearing subject. Um, I'm going to leave it there. He's published very, very widely um, uh, beyond the, um, beyond the, the, the award-winning book um, uh, in, um, in a variety of different kinds of journals as well, um, spanning a number of different fields from law to literature to anthropology. So um, with that, I welcome you and uh, please join me in, in bringing him up here to the stage. <laughs> I'm going to just give a very quick introduction to this, say just a couple of things before I get started, uh, because I know that we've started late, and I want to thank you all for making it through this snow, which apparently terrifies everybody in, <laughs> in Raleigh. We haven't had any snow in New York City this, this month. Um, this talk actually brings together three different strains of my work, and I haven't quite figured out. Uh, this will be a chapter that is a companion piece to a piece that I published a about a year ago called Hijacking Human Rights, which I will mention a little bit um, during this talk. But it brings together three of the kind of three strains in my work. One is, the, is international law and human rights generally, um, another is theories of world literature. Um, and a third is actually intellectual property, which will be very muted in this particular talk. Um, but, you might, but I'm happy to, to talk about those, th that topic as well, if you'd like, in the question and answer period. So let me jump in. At the first session of the Second Russell Tribunal in 1974, Italian philosopher, politician, and legal scholar Lelio Basso concluded his inaugural, ad uh, his inaugural address grandly. What is at stake in this trial, he said, is the very future of mankind. At a time when abuse of power is daily becoming more, more intolerable, when the tendency to reduce men to cogs spreads continually, when more and more serious attacks are being made on the supreme principles of democracy. Dire warnings about the future of mankind always have an uncanny ring to them that resonates in the present, speaking as saliently, it seems, to our contemporary moment as to the historical past that inspired them. Collectively, they constitute a speech genre in which the future of humankind is forever at risk, even as the question of who or what constitutes humankind is itself perpetually delayed. In other words, they warn of the looming loss of something that is generally taken for granted, both a future and an idea of humanity that needs to be begged in an effort to preserve it and to secure what the tribunal described as the inalienable right of peoples to decide for themselves their own future. In the face of perceived threats to humankind, Lelio Basso called people of vastly different faiths together in 1974 to defend a principle in which he said we all believe, the human right to live as a human being. The second Russell Tribunal convened to examine the causes and crimes of repression in Brazil and Latin America more widely, following the eruption of right-wing dictatorships across the continent, the 1973 CIA-sponsored coup in Chile, and the insidious economic violence of multinational corporate capitalism. The people of vastly different faiths who considered the evidence at the second Russell Tribunal included professors of history, sociology, religion, the hard sciences, and international law, as well as leaders of anti-colonial movements, philosophers, and writers, such as Gabriel Garcia Marquez and Julio Cortázar. This multidisciplinary collection of international jurors continued the tradition of the first Russell Tribunal from 1966, which convened to consider American war crimes in Vietnam, 
and whose jury included, among many others, writers James Baldwin, Simone de Beauvoir, Jean-Paul Sartre, Peter Weiss, and Alice Walker. Presumably, these poets, priests, and politicians felt they had personal and professional stakes in the future of mankind, in defending the human right to live as a human being and humanity's collective right to a future. However, they justified their, ju their judicial action not merely on sentimental or moral grounds, but also in terms of international law. Thus, they insisted that a society as little organized as that of international society is governed by an authority that is diffuse, embodied not in juridical persons or in governments, but residing in those people themselves. The only rational and real foundation of international law, they continued, is the desire for peace of men and women who share, this, share the conviction of their mutual solidarity. In other words, they claimed to be exercising the people's right to consider and condemn crimes against humanity by the mere act of gathering in its name, that is, in the name of humanity. Still, the members of the tribunal were concerned to establish their legitimacy and to bolster their legal standing by reference to accepted international law, specifically to the Martins Clause of the Hague Convention of 1907 in the first instance. Among other things, the Martins Clause affirmed that the principles of the law of nations result from the usages established among civilized peoples, language from the early 20th century, from the laws of humanity and the dictates of public conscience. Accordingly, legitimate sources of international law may then include not only the positive laws produced by states, but also customary practices and the dictates of public conscience, which it could reasonably be argued often find their best and most effective forms of expression in, human, in humanistic things such as philosophy, art, and literature. To put this more poetically, we could say that the Martins Clause from 1907 implicitly acknowledged Percy Shelley's famous claim that poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Ultimately, however, the Russell Tribunal justified its jurisdiction by citing relevant clauses from the Geneva Conventions, the UN Charter, and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which in 1948 had also claimed to speak in the name of the outraged conscience of mankind, as well as the first Russell Tribunal that found the US administration guilty of war crimes in Vietnam in 1967. As Lelio Basso notes, the humanists assembled at that first Russell Tribunal made ourselves to be the interpreters of that moral conscience, he wrote. Against the historical monopoly of states over international law, the Russell tribunals claim to be producing new international law in the name of humanity itself, which they sometimes dignified as the people's international law. Notwithstanding those legal justifications, the question of authority of these particular people's right to represent the conscience of humankind remained a begged question in the Russell tribunals. In other words, the validity of its claim was presumed when logically it would need to be demonstrated. Begged questions often take the form of tautologies where the premise of the argument is repeated as the conclusion. The conclusion is simply assumed to be true from the outset. In the case of the first Russell Tribunal in 1966, the jury openly begged the question of its authority to judge American crimes against humanity begging as well the question of who or what constitutes humanity in the first place in order to defend against its violation. At its first session, Jean-Paul Sartre highlighted precisely the begged question at the bottom of the People's Tribunal. We have not received any mandate from anyone, he said. If we have taken the initiative in coming together, we have done so because we knew that no one else could give us this mandate. Strictly speaking, only humanity as such could give such a mandate to speak in its name. Practically speaking, the Russell Tribunal could only legitimate such a right after giving moral and legal meaning to the idea of humanity by identifying the means of its negation, that is, by naming the crimes against it, crimes against humanity. 
Sartre even suggests that the begged, question, begged structure of this question is the enabling condition of the tribunal's authority to prosecute crimes against humanity on behalf of an offended humanity. What we really want, he said, is that the tribunal's legitimation be retrospective. In that regard, more than a few legal scholars and historians conclude that advances in the popular and legal discourses of crimes against humanity, a people's right to self-determination, and a more expansive understandings of genocide are traceable to the impact of these largely now forgotten humanist tribunals of the 60s and 70s, which therefore might be said to justify retrospectively as Sartre wanted, the seemingly hubristic claims to speak in the name of humanity in the first place. I want to emphasize two key points about the Russell Tribunals. First, these were, as I've said repeatedly, humanists and other intellectuals acting as if they had the right to write international law on behalf of humanity. Second, they did so precisely by begging the question of humanity. That is, by taking the category of humanity for granted without trying to define it. In 1974, Basso's human right to live as a human being begs the question of both the human and human rights, just as it begs the question of the authority to name the human as a rights-bearing creature and to declare its human rights. In that respect, it, it abides the strange logic of human rights more generally. Nearly 20 years ago, Gayatri Spivak, in her Oxford Amnesty lecture, Writing Wrongs, observed that for the purposes of declaring modern human rights, the question of nature as the ground of rights had to be begged, that is, assumed when it needed to be demonstrated, in order to use it historically. For Spivak, begging the question of nature is historical, is the historical condition of possibility for articulating human rights in a world that still does not share, as she says, any convincing universal proof that we are in fact born free. In my book, Human Rights Inc., I argued that such begged questions, typically in the form of tautologies, provide the logical armature of international law generally and human rights law specifically where there is, strictly speaking, speaking, no one, as Sartre noted, who could give a mandate for commandments. Thus, for example, in order to declare the birthrights of human beings to freedom and equality and dignity in 1948, the UN needed to presuppose those human rights without any guarantees, which they did by beg precisely by begging the question of nature and of God, in the passive voice in the first article of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. In fact, in 1946, <coughs> excuse me, when Jacques Maritain, French Catholic philosopher, was invited by UNESCO to comment on the philosophical foundations of what a UN Declaration of Human Rights should look like, he famously concluded from a survey of contemporary opinions that we agree on these rights, but on the condition that no one asks us why. To ask why, he said, to ask why would entail, I would argue, unbegging the questions of the human and human rights, would begin to parse the enabling fiction of a common humanity, and would risk breaking apart the general consensus and the idea of humanity it supports. If we need counterexamples to contrast the virtue and value of strategically begging the question of humanity, we need look no further than the American South in the time of constitutionally sanctioned plantation slavery or the US State Department today. Efforts to unbeg the questions of humanity and human rights tend to serve the purposes of discrimination, exploitation, and exclusion, as when three-fifths three of the people in Edgecombe County, North Carolina, for example, were counted as three-fifths of persons in the 1860 census for the purposes of legal representation. Or, for example, when this past summer, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo formed his new commission on unalienable rights by warning that loose talk of rights unmoors us from principles of liberal democracy. Pompeo's commission seeks explicitly to unbeg the question of, the, of human rights by offering new answers to old questions. What does it mean to say or claim that something is, in fact, a human right? 
who or what grants these rights? How can there be human rights simply by virtue of our humanity? Pompeo names the crisis of human rights today as a problem of loose talk, the kind of unauthorized rights talk that we find in popular advocacy projects like the Russell Tribunals. Indeed, Pompeo's commission has been tasked to unbeg in 2020 precisely the questions that were strategically begged by Eleanor Roosevelt and the UN Commission on Human Rights in 1948. I'll conclude tonight with some further thoughts on the Pompeo Commission, the dangers of unbegging the question of humanity and the future of human rights. But before then, I want to explore further the productive potential of begging the question of humanity, to consider the proposition that a human rights worthy of its name has to beg the question of the human if it stands any chance of living up to its promise and securing a just future for humankind. My primary example this evening is the second Russell Tribunal on repression in Latin America, which I argue had to beg the questions of humanity and human rights in 1974 in order to respond historically to the emerging challenges of neoliberalism. I situate the People's Tribunal projects in the context of the heady days between 1966 and 1976, a decade that saw a massive worldwide proliferation in the uses of the language of human rights by and on behalf of historically marginalized and exploited peoples who demanded the expansion of human rights principles that ostensibly already belonged to them at least by the logic of universalism buried within the begged question of humanity. Indeed, from the newly independent post-colonial states that now constituted a majority in the General Assembly of the United Nations, to ongoing national liberation struggles, domestic civil rights campaigns, transnational solidarity movements, and the explosion in activist NGOs in this time period, the language of human rights was seemingly, suddenly, everywhere. Some of the more notable coordinated efforts included the non-aligned movement's demands for decolonization, the third world-sponsored program for a new international economic order, which pushed for rebalancing post-colonial trade relations, development assistance, and reparations, and the people's tribunals that tended to emphasize the collective economic, social, and cultural rights of self-determination over possessive individualist rights of private property and personal liber liberty. The decade from 1966 to 76 represents a th sort of third world interregnum, I would argue, between classical imperialism and the neoliberal globalization of multinational capitalism, usually referred to at the time as neocolonialism. This decade precedes the breakthrough of human rights discourse that Sam Moyne famously identified as taking off in the U.S. and Europe in 1977. As I have recently argued in my article, Hijacking Human Rights, Moyne's breakthrough is better understood, at least from the perspective of the third world, world as a hijacking. When the U.S. and post-colonial European states rediscovered and rolled back the language of human rights in the 1970s, drastically narrowing the scope of human rights to a downsized package of civil and political protections of individuals against states. In my reading, this hijacking amounts to a repossession of the language of human rights from the decolonizing world by the Western imperial and neo-imperial powers who had ignored and betrayed the most expansive promises of human rights articulated in their own universalist declarations. In terms of tonight's talk, I would argue that this rollback entailed a neoliberal procedure of unbegging the question of humanity that underpinned the UDHR in order to exclude vast populations and peoples from the universal enjoyment or pursuit of the full array of human rights. The endpoints of this decade can be marked for convenience by the signal dates of the two UN human rights covenant, covenants both the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the one on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights were adopted by the new post-colonial majority at the UN in 1966. However, they only entered into legal force in 1976, around the time, ironically, that the Western powers regained a rhetorical, if not a moral, hegemony over human rights. So let's return to 1966, 
When Bertrand Russell, Jean-Paul Sartre, and Leila Basso, Lelio Basso established the first International War Crimes Tribunal to judge the legality of American policy in Vietnam, when representatives of, the third, of third world states and anti-imperial revolutionary movements met in Havana at the first Tricontinental Conference to found the Organization of Solidarity of the Peoples of Asia, Africa, and Latin America, and among other things, the UN adopted the two international covenants on human rights, which both featured as the premier human right for the first time in common Article I, it's the same article in both covenants, a commitment that all peoples have the right of self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. Each of those events in their own way challenged and extended the principles and practices of international law that were formalized in the wake of World War II. And each of those events pushed beyond the problem of political independence that had preoccupied the decolonization period to turn to questions of ongoing neo-colonial structures of economic, social, and cultural domination that shaped the post-colonial world order. As the General Declaration of the First Tricontinental Conference in Havana put it, the nations of Africa, Asia, and Latin America, which achieved their political independence, are becoming aware that the juridical status of a formal sovereignty does not suffice to ensure full liberation. In order to achieve total liberation, it is necessary to eliminate all forms of imperialist oppression and exploitation. And I'll come back to talk about those insistent militant adjectives, full and total, um, that are kind of added into the, the standard text of international law here. The rising concern about the economic, social, and cultural structures of neocolonial domination was reflected not merely in the internationalist agendas of third world states and political theorists, it was also taken up by leftist intellectuals and activists in the first and second worlds, who emphasized the co-complicity of politics, economics, and culture in the emerging world system of exploitation, as the Tricontinental Conference had called it, the neo-imperial globalization of capitalism that we now refer to as neoliberalism. This led many European and American intellectuals to identify a crisis of culture, of so-called Western culture itself, for enabling and sustaining global structures of exploitation. Thus, for example, in his opening speech to the first Russell Tribunal, Russell himself declared, it is our culture which is at, which is at stake. The burning children of Vietnam are martyred by the Western world. Their suffering, like that of the gassed Jews of Auschwitz, is a basic feature of the civilization which we have built. In a scathing indictment of contemporary American culture published in the Partisan Review, Susan Sontag echoes Russell. If America is the culmination of Western white civilization, then there must be something terribly wrong with Western white civilization, she wrote. The truth is that Mozart, Pascal, Boolean algebra, Shakespeare, parliamentary government, the emancipation of women, Kant, Marx, Balanchine, Belays, don't redeem what this particular civilization has wrought upon the world. In 1966, Sontag was still using illness as a metaphor to diagnose the cultural disease. The white race, she wrote, is the cancer of human history. It is the white race and it alone, its ideologies and inventions, which eradicates autonomous civilizations wherever it spreads, which has upset the ecological balance of the planet, which now threatens the very existence of life itself. Given Sontag's strong denunciation of white civilization here, there is some irony then when she shows up nine years later defending the masterworks of, of European literature in an issue of a Mexican comic book, Fantomas, The Elegant Menace. In that issue, Sontag is in double traction in a Los Angeles hospital, having survived an assassination attempt that was spurred by her public condemnation of a wave of cultural terrorism breaking out across the globe. For weeks, European literary classics have been disappearing from national libraries around the world. The rash of anti-literary violence has even precipitated an outbreak of preemptive book burning. From the British Library, books by major national authors have disappeared, along with the invaluable manuscripts of Chaucer and H.G. Wells, among others. In France, the works of Victor Hugo and Proust have vanished. In Rome, Dante, Petrarch, Virgil, and Ovid 
are all listed among the disappeared. In Calcutta, Tokyo, Moscow, Bogota, and Buenos Aires, entire libraries burned to the ground. The comic book hero, Fantomas, has reached Sontag in her hospital bed after calling other world-renowned writers, Alberto Moravia, Octavio Paz, and Julio Cortazar, in an effort to assess the extent of the damage to world literature. The Mexican version of Fantomas is modeled on an early 20th century French criminal villain by the same name. However, he is now a millionaire playboy with a taste for fine art, buxom women, and international intrigue. Using his own personal copy of a manuscript of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales as bait, Fantomas sets a trap to uncover the transnational corporate conspiracy to destroy the world's books. The trail leads to Paris and one of the richest men in France, George Steiner, apparently not that George Steiner, <laughs> who heads the corporation Steiner and Company, and I assume that the, the, um, the implicit anti-Semitic overtones of this has to do with trying to represent this as a globalist conspiracy, and that's what it's supposed to signify. In a showdown, Steiner declares that books are, devils, are the devil's invention. They will lead to the world's destruction. But Fantomas defends literature forcefully. Books are the fount of all wisdom, he says. Men, not books, will lead to the world's destruction. Fantomas foils the plot, but Steiner consoles himself with the thought that the company has at least destroyed hundreds of irreplaceable books. Fantomas, however, who has the latest technology, informs Steiner that he made photocopies of all the books, and so will restore the world's written treasures. Defeated, the conspirators blow themselves up, inexplicably. Fantomas barely escapes and reflects on his sudden good fortune. His private book collection will increase in value a hundredfold. Ha, ha, ha. I want to stress that this is an ordinary issue of a popular comic series in Mexico in 1975. The story will get more complicated when I overlay a second, a second story on top of this. Before introducing this comic book, I listed some important international events of 1966. The first Russell Tribunal, the meeting of the Tricontinental, and the adoption of the two UN Human Rights Covenants, which both featured self-determination as the first human right. And following the comic book, I want to underscore especially the language of cultural development at the end of that first article. Together, these events represented a strong third world challenge to Western hegemony by having put self-determination on the growing list of officially recognized human rights. Indeed, from the perspective of the third world and oppressed peoples across the globe, 1966 was both a pivotal and a pinnacle year in the legal history of self-determination and development. And in some ways, I would argue, it marked the beginning of the end of the third world itself, at least as a project of grand humanity and a source of alternative visions, alternative hopeful visions for the international order as I've argued in Hijacking Human Rights. Ironically, perhaps, over the course of the decade, between the completion of the two international covenants and their entry into force in 1976, the premier human right of self-determination lost much of its anti-imperial luster and actual force as it was supplanted by the logic and giddy discourse of development. There's a romantic third worldist history of the human rights to self-determination and development sometimes referred to as the Bandung spirit, that presents the meeting of African and Asian states at the Bandung Conference in 1955 as a, ra a radical revolutionary event that challenged the very basis of the post-war and post-colonial world order. Indeed, the Bandung spirit did achieve major successes in international law, such as the UN Declaration on the Granting of Independence to Colonial Countries and Peoples from 1960, which largely accepted language drafted at Bandung and paved the way for Article I in both of, the, both of the international covenants. However, far from rejecting the principles of human rights or statist internationalism, Bandung in fact doubled down on the promises of the international order, demanding that the entire package of human rights, including self-determination and development, be extended to all peoples. Indeed, it committed the third world countries to the fundamental principles of human rights as set forth in the Charter of the United Nations and in the UDHR. And like the non-aligned movement that followed it, the conference noted the lack of a Marshall Plan for the third world, 
and called on the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, that is the World Bank, to allocate a greater part of its resources to Asian African countries. In 1966, however, at the Tricontinental meeting, these third world demands for self-determination and development were given a much more militant anti-imperialist cast. The conference proclaims the inalienable right of all peoples to full political independence and to resort to all forms of struggle that may be necessary, including armed struggle to conquer that right. It's worth noting, however, that behind the militant tone, the first tricontinental, like Bandung before it, repeats the principles of state sovereignty, self-determination, and human rights upon which the international order was, at least nominally, established placing great stress on those insistent, emphatic adjectives that reinforce and extend the standard language of international law, total liberation, full self-determination. Of course, it's not possible to make imperial international law, nor imperialists for that matter, blush by adding a few uncompromising adjectives to ideals that purported to be universal in the first place. The demand for total liberation and cultural decolonization as human rights sounds revolutionary. The conference proclaims the right of all peoples to maintain and develop their cultural heritage and the need for peoples of the three continents to wage an active fight to expel from their cultural life the expressions of imperialist influence, thus enriching the lives of their peoples with true art and culture. But the demand is tempered by an old humanist appeal to participate in the common cultural heritage of mankind. That is, a UNESCO-esque demand for access to the enormous material and intellectual wealth that the knowledge and the work of man have accumulated for centuries. This right of access, I would argue, is part of the rhetorical mechanism that turned revolutionary demands into reformatory appeals and prepared the ground for the neoliberalization of intellectual property and the cultural economy in the 1980s. Houari Boumediene, the Algerian secretary general of the non-aligned movement, summed up this general the general trajectory of this period well, I think, when he insisted to the UN General Assembly in 1974 that the colonialist and imperialist powers accepted the principle of the right of peoples to self-determination only when they had already succeeded in setting up the institutions and machinery that were, would perpetuate the system of pillage established in the colonial era. From that perspective, the human right to self-determination, with its implications for socioeconomic development and cultural sovereignty, was universalized in, in law only after the scaffolding for the world system of neo-colonial exploitation was in place. That may seem too severe, an assessment of the com complex workings of the international order in the 60s and 70s, but all of the texts that I'm looking at tonight, literary, legal, revolutionary, and otherwise, were trying to identify and name the trans transformations in the international system, veiled linkages among economics, law, and culture that continued to disadvantage the third world even at the moment when the third world appeared to have achieved a certain moral authority and political advantage at the UN. In other words, they were trying to name the crisis precipitated by the Euro-American hijacking of human rights, the retooling of self-determination, of permanent sovereignty over natural resources, and development economics into weapons against full independence, total self-determination, true art, and culture. This then is a rough sketch of the international political scene that the Fantomas comic enters in 1975. Although the Mexican comic book presents the loss of libraries and literature as a global disaster, it does so in the internationalist terms that predominated in the 60s and 70s. That is, although the conspiracy against books is transnational, with its CEO headquartered in Paris, its primary targets are national libraries and the canonical texts and authors of national literatures. This construction of the threat to world literature reflects two overlapping assumptions of the early post-colonial period, that both political and cultural independence come primarily through the statist form of the nation inherited from European colonialism itself. Indeed, those Euro-Enlightenment presuppositions became anti-imperial imperatives for radical third world thinkers like Franz Fanon, who famously insisted that only a national culture birthed in the revolutionary struggle against imperialism, 
would make it possible to be present at the universal trysting place, fully armed. That national consciousness is the only thing that will give us an international dimension. UNESCO also shared and reinforced these, na reinforced these nationalist assumptions with its, with, with its cultural development agenda throughout the 60s and 70s. It sought to fortify the conceptual connection between literacy, literature, and development with its declarations of the charter of the book and of 1972 as International Book Year, and its support for a new world information order that might act as a cultural and intellectual counterpart to the new international economic order on, on offer. The Fantomas comic makes no explicit links between literature and development, except perhaps in this caricatured image of the remotest parts of the earth, an image presumably of what the most underdevelopment parts of the earth looked like in the Mexican imagination at the time. However, in the hands of Julio Cortazar, one of the jury members of the Second Russell Tribunal, and a character in the Mexican comic book, some of the links between culture, development, and human rights come into clearer view. The Mexican comic book, in which Cortazar and Sontag make cameo appearances, was published one month after the second meeting of the Second Russell Tribunal on repression in Latin America. Cortazar was sent a copy of this, the original comic book, and given his taste for self-referential meta-literary storytelling, he saw a postmodern opportunity to bring the worlds of international law and literature together, furthering the work of the tribunal by other means, by putting its findings into the mass culture circuits and popular print economy of Latin American comic books. So Cortazar rewrote the original comic, publishing his version also in a full-size comic book format. That's what it looks like. It actually circulated as a comic book in Latin America. Fantomas versus the Multinational Vampires, Unattainable Utopia is the title. Cortazar's version ends with an appendix that includes the full verdict of the Second Russell Tribunal, which found, among other things, that the North American multinationals, for their own profit, organized not only the plunder of Latin American resources, but also the violation of fundamental human rights that this entails. As part of a strategy, the verdict read, to prevent the economic development of the Latin American countries and the management of their own affairs. Cortazar's story begins with the narrator, Cortazar, leaving the chambers of the Russell Tribunal in Brussels, heading for a train to Paris, and picking up a copy of Fantomas at the newsstand. Here is the scene Cortazar offers of his imagined embarrassment at reading the original Mexican comic book on a French train while his fellow passengers read more sophisticated intellectual fare in the national languages. This is an ironic image of cultural underdevelopment that I'll come back to at the end. It made the narrator feel almost idiotic opening this little garishly covered, colored magazine, on the cover of which a gentleman in a purple cape and white mask lunged toward the reader as if to reproach him for having made such a senseless purchase, to say nothing of the little advertisement for Pepsi Cola in the lower right-hand corner. In between the garish cover and the gruesome appendix containing the verdict of the Russell Tribunal, the story intersperses scenes from the original Fantomas comic, while Cortazar and Sontag consult repeatedly by phone to uncover the global conspiracy and to try to persuade the masked hero that the story told in the original comic book is a lie. I'd bet my ass, says Sontag, that Steiner and his accomplices didn't die in that fire. Fantomas fell for the oldest trick in the book. He thought the mission was over, that this is where the important part begins. Sontag suggests that the comic is itself part of the problem. Fantomas' adventures are another big lie the system's experts are using as a smoke, sc smoke screen, she tells Cortazar, exactly like the Alliance for Progress or the OAS or Reform Instead of Revolution or the Development Banks. Details about the real conspiracy behind the cultural terrorism, she insists, are to be found in the verdict of the Russell Tribunal, conveniently reprinted in the appendix of Cortazar's text. Julio, who is the real Steiner? Whom did the Russell Tribunal condemn in Brussels? They have a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand names, he said the narrator. But above all, they're called ITT. They're called Nixon and Ford, Henry Kissinger, or CIA or DIA. They're called Pinochet or General or Colonel. They have those special names where every name means thousands of names, vampire companies. <laughs> 
Following Sontag's advice, Cortazar urges Fantomas himself to consult the appendix, showing him the final pages of this very volume. If you want a summary, he says, I can give it to you in one word, multinationals. The search for answers beyond the ending of the Fantomas comic parallels the challenges faced by the Russell Tribunal itself in trying to identify the new international system of economic domination that triggered, even required in the tribunal's judgment, the more obvious human rights abuses of torture, disappearance, and state murder that were characteristic of the Latin American dictatorships. Indeed, one of the points I want to make tonight is that through the lens of systematic violations of human rights, the second Russell Tribunal attempted in 1975 to make visible and to name the socioeconomic crimes of the nascent neoliberal world order with the handy language of human rights, a language that could only be construed to cover such crimes because of its original question begging in the 1940s. Thus, they sought to name the crisis of neoliberalism at its beginning by drawing some of the hidden links between the economic problems and the violence, that is, between transnational economic domination and the national deprivation of civil and political rights by dictatorial regimes. Thus, the tribunal repeatedly insisted that systematic violations of human rights are committed within a system of economic domination, and that torture, summary execution, and disappearance were part of the means, not just the manifestation, of establishing the new system of neocolonial economic domination, as well as the curtailment of political, social, and cultural self-determination. Thus, they concluded, the destruction of individual liberties must here be seen as the installation of a repressive system designed to prevent the evolution of socioeconomic structures towards an improvement of the condition of the life of a whole people. In, particularly, in particular, they identified multinational firms as the two-handed engines of this system. To prevent the exercise of human rights, the tribunal asserted the multinationals have recourse to every means of repression, including murder. Citing chapter and verse of relevant international legal agreements, the second Russell Tribunal found the governments of Brazil, Chile, Uruguay, and Bolivia guilty of crimes against humanity. And the US administration and multinational corporations housed in the US were condemned for aiding and abetting those regimes. There are two things I find especially important about this human rights project of people's international law, both of which have to do with invisibility or the apparent illegibility of economic exploitation and cultural domination within Euro-American discourses of human rights and classical international law. On the one hand, the tribunal was trying to make visible the largely invisible hands of transnational corporate capitalism by revealing the links between torture and neo-imperial economics. On the other hand, they were trying to develop a method of accounting for the social, political, and cultural costs of what was then called invisible trade which included, among other things, speculative finance capital, debt servicing, transactions in the service sector, intangible goods, and intellectual property, all primary sectors in today's neoliberal economic order. Long before Naomi Klein's shock doctrine, the Russell Tribunal was attempting to document the largely hidden and disavowed complicities between neoliberal economics, orchestrated underdevelopment, and physical human rights abuses in neoliberalism's opening phase. Presented with that picture in Cortazar's comic, Fantomas is nostalgic for an older, the older days of Manichaean anti-imperial struggle. Indeed, when the narrator provides evidence of the role of transnational corporations, especially communications and media companies in the coup d'etat in Chile, Fantomas responds with exasperation. There's something I don't like about this, buddy, says Fantomas. You know, I favor direct action, and this talk of multinationals is going to get in the way of my mano a mano tactics. These companies are like worms that multiply the more you cut them into little pieces. The nematodic powers of transnational corporations operate also, of course, in the field of culture. When Susan Sontag, in, the, in Cortazar's version of the comic, concludes that the original Fantomas comic is itself a smokescreen, she implicitly expensed, extends, to the Mexican, excuse me, extends to the Mexican comic book the ideological critique that Ariel Dorfman and Armand Madelart leveled at Disney in their 1971 book, How to Read Donald Duck. She also seems to anticipate an agenda item for the next meeting of the Russell Tribunal, 
which proposed to define with greater clarity the role of multinationals in the deculturization of the Latin American peoples. Madelar and Dorfman, who presented evidence, by the way, to the Tribunal of Cultural Repression in Chile under Pinochet, published their discourse analysis of Donald Duck comics before the CIA and ITT-backed coup that ended the democratically elected socialist government in Chile. They made their critique of Disney's cultural imperialism on two fronts, the ideological content of Disney comics and the material impact of Disney's imported cultural commodities on the creative economies of Latin America. Power to Donald Duck, they argued, means the promotion of underdevelopment. The daily agony of third world peoples is served up as a spectacle for per the permanent enjoyment in the utopia of bourgeois liberty. Furthermore, they argued the penetration of Disney into third world literary markets fostered cultural underdevelopment, making, they said, developing nations dependent on cultural commodities arising economically and intellectually in the power center's total alien foreign conditions. In this regard, a small detail in Cortazar's description of the Fantomas comic, which he felt silly reading, is especially telling. A little, garishly covered, a little garishly colored magazine with its little advertisement for Pepsi Cola in the lower right hand corner. When we turn the cover of the comic book, that little advertisement for Pepsi Cola turns into a big advertisement with a tie in to Disney. While Sontag urges Fantomas to search beyond the pages of the comic book for the global conspiracy that is disappearing culture and knowledge, in a poignant illustration of Donald Duck's po actual power and the emergent world system of neo-colonial cultural domination, the transnational corporations have already have wormed their way into the story before it's even begun. This is the kind of link between neo-imperial economics and cultural domination that the second Russell Tribunal was trying to make visible in the people's language of human rights and that would remain illegible, they suggested, in terms of traditional international law. In this regard, Cortazar's experimental metacomic should be read, I would argue, as part of the People's International Legal Project to make visible the networks of hidden relations that the Tricontinental had called the world system of exploitation. To draw some conclusions from these overlapping stories I've told about the extension of the language of human rights, let me pull back the focus to the question of begging the question of humanity with which I began. All of the challenges to the hegemonic international order that I've discussed, from decolonization and Bandung to tricontinental demands for total self-determination and the Russell tribunals, all of those advanced their cause by seizing upon the expansiveness of the begged question at the bottom of human rights. Each group sought to extend human rights in the world by insisting that the begged category of humanity on whose behalf human rights were declared in the UDHR rightly pertained to them. In other words, they acted as subjects that did not have the rights that they had and had the rights that they had not, in Jacques Rancière's words, in order to make the seemingly self-evident point that, for example, all human beings referred to in Article I of the UDHR and all peoples in Article I of the two international covenants must apply equally to those people historically left out of the scope of its putative universalism. The Western hijacking of human rights I've described was a strong reaction to precisely these kinds of claims for inclusion, and it entailed unbegging the basic questions of human rights, a late retraction of enlightenment principles that amounted to the US and Europe saying, that is not it at all. That is not what we meant at all. Just as Winston Churchill did after World War II, when he declared that the Atlantic Charter's commitment to the right of all peoples to choose the form of government under which they live would not, however, apply to the British colonies. Unbegging the questions of human rights is on the agenda again today, under our current rollback of human rights. This past summer, when Mike Pompeo announced the formation of his Commission on Unalienable Rights, he warned that we must be vigilant that human rights discourse not be hijacked for dubious purposes. I have no idea if my essay and that statement have any relationship with each other. Loose talk of rights, Pompeo said, blurs the distinction between unalienable rights and ad hoc rights granted by governments. Not everything, that is, not everything good can be a universal right. Pompeo's commission is a cynical rights washing exercise. Headed by the socially conservative law professor and legal historian Marianne Glendon, 
tasked to recover the so-called natural and unalienable rights that all our, our loose talk has supposedly devalued. Thus, he says, we must revisit the most basic questions. And these are from his press conference, so they're awkwardly stated, and they're very hard to read, but you'll follow the, you'll follow the ideas. How, and that they're also on the State Department's website. How do we know or how do we determine whether that claim that this or that is a human right is true and therefore ought it to be honored? How can there be human rights we possess not as privileges we are granted or even earned, but simply by virtue of our humanity belong to us? Is it in fact true, as our Declaration of Independence asserts, that as human beings, we, all of us, every member of our human family, are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights? Is it true, I wonder, which part? The part about the creator, the part about the rights belonging to us, the part about the Declaration of Independence being an authoritative document on what it means to be human, the part where we are all human beings and members of the human family. The questions and their implied answers sound ominous. What I want to suggest is that begged questions are not always or merely logical fallacies. Sometimes they're excellent politics. Indeed, in our current moment, begging the question of the human seems to be as it was for the Russell tribunals on the side of humanity, while unbegging the question of human rights is part of a right-wing strategy for rights repossession. In the humanities today, and in literary studies especially, we seem obsessed with the question of the human. That makes sense. We're humanists. And given the feeling of urgency of the moment, the crisis for humanity, human rights, the humanities, and the future. However, looking back over the history of human rights in the middle to late 20th century, it seems that there is something to be said for strategically begging the questions of the human and humanity in the name of humanity itself. Thank you. Thank you so much for this really wonderful talk. Um, I haven't seen Susan Sontag as a cartoon character in a very long time, so um, I appreciated that among many other things in the talk. Um, I suppose uh, this is a larger couch question that's couched in a smaller question. So I'll give you the smaller question first. Um, uh, the smaller question is, how should we read the appearance of uh, Pepsi and Disney in the Fantomas um, uh, catalog? Because it seems to me that the methodology that you propose about begging the question within human rights is somewhat at odds with the type of reading strategy you adopt. Um, and I wonder if one of the things that you're saying here um, is that indeed begging the question has to applied, be applied not only to human rights, but indeed to those things that seem obvious, that seem to be showing X or Y. And so does Pepsi and Disney there not instead prove something about multinational corporations, but instead uh, offer another opportunity to beg the question. The reason I ask that is because of the example of something like Heinemann within world literature. Um, uh, and as I'm sure you're aware, Heinemann um, was a British colonial press that uh, started out uh, really using Africa and, and the colonies as um, uh, markets uh, for uh, their works. But then in the course of the 1960s, ended up turning to those sites as being places for new literature. And so you have the African Writers Series arising with someone like Chinua Achebe and uh, Ngugi Wathiyo etc., which makes it the case then that that which is most conservative ends up giving rise to something that we now think of as a kind of pillar of um, intervention against a colonial. Uh, and so I'm interested in opening up the question, and here's the broader question, whether that which appears to be conservative or multinational should instead have its question begged in terms of the larger history of um, what something like Heinemann offers us. And apologies for the long question. Turning the page and seeing Disney there after having grown up on Dorfman's analysis, right, was just a smack in the face, right? The first time it was like, seriously, Disney's the inside of the front cover, right? And all throughout the, this this comic book, Disney is already there. So um, the Dorfman and Madelar analysis is already, in, if you accept their analysis, right, as as purely oppress oppressive, right, which is what they argue. Um, then the game is already lost, right? The examples you've given of Heinemann, and there are many other examples, the Congress, the CIA-sponsored Congress for Cultural Freedom that actually sponsored the first um, conference of, of, of writers of uh, African writers of English, of English in the English language um, in Makerere in 1962, are often condemned because, those things are often condemned because, say, the CIA was behind it. 
right? Or a, co or a corporation was behind it. When in fact, they were also the condition of possibility for Chinua Chebe. They were the condition of possibility, for, they were the condition of possibility for African literature. And one of the things that I think, um, especially um, uh, young students today, even of African literature, don't want to hear you know, is that there is something enabling, as Gayatri Spivak put it, right, the enabling violation of colonialism, there is something enabling to these kinds of structures which require, would require us to be fair to, see, to thinking about what the upshots are of these things to actually beg the question that you're asking, right? I've left it, in, in this talk at least, I've left it entirely in Dorfman and Madelart's terms, but that's not the way that, I, I haven't, worked my way through what's going on here, right, with this specific example of Pepsi and Disney. But in terms of things like Heinemann, in terms of things like these other kinds of corporate, you know, intrusions that become the condition of possibility, we do have to actually beg that question in a certain kind of way. We also, however, have to remember that in the 1980s, Alan Hill, who was the, uh, who was the, um, the, the CEO of Heinemann, uh, of Heinemann Books, um, actually said in his biography that they were winning back the empire that the government had foolishly lost. In other words, they were putting out of business local publishing industries. Um, and I go into that in, in much more detail in this, in, in a, a longer version of this. Uh, and so you have both of those things happening at the same time. On the one hand, they're enabling condition. On the other hand, they're absolutely oppressive, right? And they're shutting down all sorts of other kinds of possible literatures that don't then get produced. And this is a, a, probably a fussier question, but it's around um, the, 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 uh, the kind of the speech act um, issues around begging the question. That, mm -hmm. And it struck me that there was, there, there's a kind of double-edged quality to that. On the one hand, a self-referentialness. It's always humanity itself, or it's, which gets to the tautology, which right. gets to the reference to totality. To the, but, then, but then also a, there, there is a dimension of, of, of heter heteronomy in that as well, around the invocation of because no one else. There's the invocation of the of that limit structure, or the just 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 the notion of, of conscience as a kind of, kind of internalization of law and of uh, which is there from the outset. And and I and I, I guess what I'm asking is whether I guess what I'm curious about is that double-edged structure feels like it comes into full view around the place of fiction and your, that is the, the kind of metafictional. Turn that 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 um, that um, kind of teasing out the structure of autonomy and heteronomy um, gets played out um, partly in in answer to a kind of essentializing that that you were talking about around the you know reversion to us, but also in in as a, as the recourse to capture a kind of invisibility in the um, in the multinational you know in, in the in the in the in the systemic um, um, scope of the uh, multinational, um, but so anyway, I'm not sure. Turn that into a question, I guess. Is, yeah. <laughs> well, I think that I, I, the double edge, the double edge nature of it is, is again important, and I think it's going back to the same idea of you know the begging the question, begging the question of these kind of institutional structures. Um, in Human Rights Inc., I actually talk about this in in great detail in terms of the formal structures of the law. Um, and of international law in particular, that's, that often produ produces a legal document that starts with a preamble that states what is supposedly obvious, and then almost always repeats uh, often the exact language from the preamble in the articles as the things that need to happen, right? And so it's obvious that we're all born free and equal in dignity and rights. Uh, therefore, everyone has the right to be, everyone is born free and equal in dignity and rights. And it does both of these things at the same time. And it, in that sense, it literally begs the question, but it becomes the formal architecture, right, of the law. I actually then go on to talk about that's actually the formal, a, a form of the formal architecture of the Bildungsroman, but I won't do that right now. Um, I do think it has a double edge. One of the things that I was trying to do with that when I, when I started to um, make that argument and think about that structure is to think about the enabling possibilities of that, right? It seems like it's a limiting thing. It seems like it's closed off. It seems like it's logically fallacious. It seems like we have to, we're, we're just accepting a kind of European discourse of universalism, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it's filled with all sorts of inconsistencies and it creates all sorts of temporal problems. Because one of the things it does is it, it says that, that something is true in the past or we recognize it as morally true, but now we need to make it actively and positively true, right? And that introduces, that introduces time into the equation. Um, and so, I mean, I, I don't know that I'm 
fully getting at your, fully getting at the question that you wanted me to form for you for myself. Um, but, <laughs> but um, I, I think that the double edge is actually always really important to me. Right, I'm thinking about both the limiting and the enabling qualities of those uh, of those structures. To what extent does, in one particular case that occurs to me, begging the question of the human and human rights backfire on the liberal project, which is of course begging the question of human rights when those rights are claimed by corporations. Mm -hmm. So, so the human rights of the corporation, as they sort of translate into this language, without without questioning the foundation of the human, how do you critique? The corporate human, or the the, the collective human, mm -hmm. and, and the increasing claims on rights, both particular and universal, both domestic and international. And the second, which is a bigger question, a little more unfair than that one, is: so, does begging the question of the human and the human right is anything in this analysis also a strategy, or provide any pathway for reinserting the humanist back into the legal discourse that they seem to have been excluded from? This, there, we've lost the era that you're talking about that's given over. To, to legal and economic discourse and a variety of other fields and disciplines, and one no longer would imagine, um, it's very hard to imagine a comic book today with, uh, you know, with, with you in it. Um, so, you know, what, what has happened, and does this, is this a strategy towards that, or, or if, and if not, then what, what is the, the goal of this pushback on Mike Pompeo mm -hmm. in this capacity? Right? Mm -hmm. Um, the strategy backfiring, that is begging the question. So first of all, I'm not convinced how far I would go with advocating this as the strategy, but that is begging the question of the human, right? I have been bothered by the fact that, that literary studies has wrapped itself in knots for the last 15 years with endlessly asking what the human is, what the human is. And some really important and good information has come from that, and really important and good work has come from that, right? But we seem to have, and the way I put it in another essay, was we seem to be trying to rescue the human for the humanities while we leave the technical language of the person, right, to the law and to lawyers and to bureaucrats and things like that. And so while we are rescuing the human, all the, the law doesn't even care. Right, because it's going off to do its it's going off to do its its business, right? In the terms of the person, that's a way to kind of connect the, to try to connect the two questions. Because the question about the multinationals is, it, when you beg the question of the human, and then you start using language like persons, which is the legally the legal technical term, right? That becomes the entryway precisely for corporations to to go to the European Court of Human Rights and claim that they too have human rights. Um, one of the interesting things about the verdict of the Second Russell Tribunal is they have two long paragraphs um, uh, denouncing the demand by corporations for recognition in international law. So at the same time, it seems to me the fundamental operation that from which they work is they beg the question right, of the human. They also go, yeah, but you're not one of those. You're not one of those humans, right? So don't be claiming that you get, you get certain kinds of rights in inter international law itself. Um, so it backfires sort of, right? If one kept consistently to the language of the human, I'm not sure it would have backfired. Right? But when the slippage comes in of the, of the, the legal category of the person from Roman, in, from Roman law, that's where it backfires, it seems to me. The other side of this is yes. I mean, um, in going back to, so I read um, Cortazar's book in Spanish when I was a graduate student, founded at the Benson Latin American Library um, in Austin, Texas, and just had no idea what to do with it. Like, what is this thing? This is just insane. Susan Sontag's in this? Why is she in the hospital? What's going on here? Um, and it just kind of sat in the back of my head for basically 20 years. Um, and then it was recently translated into English, and I put it on my next syllabus, right? And I'm like, I'm going back, I'm going to see what this is. And what I didn't remember at all from this was that last part of it's it's all about the Russell Tribunal. I didn't remember this at all. That had disappeared entirely from my memory. And that's how I started going into the Russell, the two Russell tribunals, but really the second one is the one I'm especially interested in here. The other one's gotten had a lot more work done um, on it. You can't, or I haven't been able to find the verdict of the second Russell tribunal online. It's in Cortazar's book. You can find it now on Amazon, right? If you buy the Corta, if you buy the Cortazar book, but it's not online somehow. So I don't know what the conspiracy is there, yeah. right? Um, um, so yes, I mean, part of what I think I'm trying to figure out here is what, how, can, how can we humanists find our way back into the conversation? I mean, some of us are there, but we've worked really hard and practically killed ourselves to be in the conversation and are still ignored. 
right, even though we're in the conversation. I can publish a historical piece in Human Rights Quarterly. I can put it in a historical journal, and the historians are still going to probably ignore it, mostly ignore it. Um, and the lawyers are mostly going to ignore it, right? That they're going to ignore the historians as well. And so I'm, tr I'm, I'm really interested in the ways in which they, they, they had a moment, and I don't think it's just something that's going to be peculiar to the 1960s. I think we need to rethink, we need to think about our moment um, in a different way. And I don't know that this is, this is the paradigm, but, but I like the paradigm. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to go back to the muted aspect of the talk, which was intellectual property. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously Disney pops in in the comic and it's the most famously copyrighted, Mickey Mouse is the most famously copyrighted animated figure. And there was an early reference to photocopying as saving the world library, right. which theoretically, I guess you'd be photocopying things in the public domain, so maybe it's okay. Sure. But I'm just curious if you could excavate the intellectual property angle and the fact that um, world literature's property status seems to be part of your argument, but in the hidden networks of, of it as it's currently articulated. So for me, in this, in, in, with this particular set of materials in this configuration, um, it's very muted, right? The intellectual property stuff is very muted. What, what really interests me and um, will be part of the elaboration of that aspect here is that one of the things that happens in the 1970s is as the third world seems to capture the UN and capture international law in a certain kind, in a certain kind of way, um, the, the, the U.S. in particular, but Europe as well, um, responds by trying to figure out how to evade the, inter, the, the international legal structure. So as, as Anthony Yangi writes about, um, the, the transnational law develops as the way to deal with corporations. So you guys can have your international, you, you cute little post-colonial states can have your international law. We've got transnational law over here, which allows our multinationals to do this, that, and the other thing, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and so they construct an entirely new regime. They construct a new system of arbitration. One of those new systems is, um, especially under Reagan, is a concerted effort by the U.S. to rewrite intellectual property law, right? Um, and to make more things property. Um, and so the, un, in, un, during Reagan's time, um, there was an awareness in the, in the, um, in his, among his administration that the U.S. was no longer manufacturing much, right? But it was manufacturing culture. And so they needed to figure out a way to monetize culture. And so they, strength, they, were, they managed to, con, to construct a much stronger intellectual property regime, mm -hmm. right? That immediately increased the, wealth, the national wealth of the U.S. Mm -hmm. But what it really did was increase the power of, of companies like Disney. Right um, to control their image and to control and to control their properties. So I, here I'm mostly interested in that as an alternative, as an alternative legal regime. One of the neoliberal consequences, right, of the of pushing back against the third world's emerging um, emerging power and emerging interests. I'd, I'd like you to say a little bit more about the kind of performative aspect of the Russell Tribunal. Um, the question of enforceability and non-enforceability, I suppose, um, and how how one might think of that in terms of the kind of figuration of the legal under the guy uh, under the 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 name. Well, I mean, you've called it naming the crisis, right? Mm -hmm. um, under uh, under the naming of oneself and the presentation of oneself as a tribunal, with indeed a right to. Um, to to put um, all these people on trial, mm -hmm. as it were. Um, so I'm 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 sort of interested in the fictionality of um, of uh, of enforceability, if you like, um, and how that plays with um, uh, the, uh, the 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 figure of the human. The last part I'm going to have to think about. Yeah. The, the, um, 
Uh, the, the performative part um, and the enforceability questions, I think, are really interesting. So the first Russell Tribunal, which is um, one of the first major people's tribunals to, to occur, um, gets a lot of press, even in the U.S., right, where um, that it's trying war crimes and crimes against humanity, the U.S. Administration for War Crimes and Crimes Against Humanity in Vietnam. It actually gets a lot of coverage. Um, it meets in multiple locations. It's clearly a performance. None of the people who are indicted, right, um, are going to show up, right? But they denounce it, which was a mistake um, in terms of the performativity of it, because it attracts attention to the it attracts, attracts attention to the performance. So they published their verdicts, they published their findings, and they showed up in newspapers around the world. Less in the U.S. than they did all over Europe, but they were denounced in the U.S. for the for the findings and for not having the authority, right, to try these things. They didn't have the authority, um, so it's very much a it is very much a performance. It's a performance of what they call a people's right, um, and so they themselves are claiming to construct a new body of international law. Eventually, this leads to a group called the permanent the permanent. Um, People's the Permanent People's Tribunal. Lelio, ba Lelio Basso founds the Permanent People's Tribunal. And in 1976, they write the Algiers Declaration of People's Rights, which nobody pays any attention to and is barely available on the, uh, available on the internet, that is supposed to be an alternative, uh, alternative system. And they've conducted 30 or so different people's tribunals over the last 40 years. And they publish their findings still, um, and they cite their own international. They now cite their own international law and their own international precedent as as part of the legitimacy. The second Russell Tribunal, through the, the in the performance of this, gets almost no attention. Nobody cares, or nobody seems to care. The repression in Latin America isn't big enough um, in the U.S. or in Europe at the time to to make it into the papers. And part of what happens with the uh, the Fantomas comic, I think, is Cortazar and Sontag actually did have a conversation about the, the about the Russell Tribunal. She was involved in various kinds of ways over the over the course of the tribunals, um, and he was clearly angry that 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 the findings of the Russell Tribunal were not available anywhere. They weren't being published. They weren't appearing in the newspapers in the U.S. And I honestly think it was a really desperate, earnest thing to try to circulate the the, the verdict of the Russell Tribunal to throw it in a comic book. I mean, it's very Cortazar Cortazar. Um, but it's also, I think, a, a really earnest piece of performance, right? So I think that, to my mind, the performativity is actually actually ends up having having important impacts. And there are legal scholars who will now say that the first Russell Tribunal actually widened the, the idea of crimes against humanity from the Nuremberg principles that eventually lead to the ICC and the International Court of Justice and things like that. Um, and they actually did have an impact even though they were mostly performance in a certain kind of way. Okay, with that, we have to say thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.